listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. So hi everyone, welcome one, welcome all to Changing Reality. To all of our returning viewers, thank you so much for tuning in today. We truly, truly appreciate every single moment of your time and for your love and attention towards our show. And to all of our new viewers, welcome to Changing Reality. Where have you been all this time? This is the place to be. So if you don't know, Changing Reality is a show on WQHS radio that features phenomenal people from all walks of life who are, in essence, changing their own reality. And through this show, we have the opportunity to speak to, hang out, and interview amazing individuals from social change makers, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, industry experts, business owners, to even artists, musicians, and inspiring individuals from all across the world. And hopefully, by hearing their stories on how they managed to get started, on how they've grown over the years to doing the amazing things that they've achieved so far, we'll be able to uncover a little bit of the nuggets of wisdom within their stories that we can take and apply to our own lives, to grow in our own areas of interest, and to shorten our learning curves if we're lucky. And this is a show that I felt was something that was so essential to our entire student life, simply because I felt like there were so many people out there who do phenomenal things and make waves in the lives of the people around them. And I'm super passionate about hearing their stories, their experiences, the good and the bad of how they actually managed to achieve all of that. And by hearing these stories, It's not only changed the life of me, but it's changed the life of so many other students, so many other people out there. And I wanted to bring that to a wider audience with this show. And to show you how impactful the power of stories has been in my own life, I actually personally founded and run a youth movement called Ascendance that started off back home where I'm from in Malaysia, but today collaborates with not just our Malaysian Ministry of Education, but works with over 28, uh, that works with over 28 countries to help provide an alternative education platform for any student who wants to change the reality. So we work with students from elementary all the way up to college through various sessions, programs, experiential learning activities, and projects that help them discover their passion learn about themselves and the world around them, and even start their own careers while they're still in school. And we've been fortunate to work with over 35,000 students, 970 communities, and have incubated countless number of student-run projects and social enterprises run by students as young as 8 to 25 years old. And the reason we've been able to do all of that has been stories. It's been kind individuals who have been willing to take time out of their busy schedules to actually come in and share what made a difference for them and the lessons that they have learned along the way. And similarly, I hope this show is that same platform for all of you, that through this show, you are able to learn what you need to figure out what you love, get that hit start, and hopefully answer the questions that you are currently asking on your journey to success as well. And if there's anything specific that you want to talk about, whether it's a specific industry, a specific experience, do reach out to us and we'll see how we can incorporate it best into the show to help you guys change your reality as well. And moving into today's episode, we are actually speaking to alumni with an amazing story that I am very excited to get into. Our speaker today co-leads McKinsey's M&A work globally. And in this capacity, he actually advises CEOs and other executives on transactions of all types. So from large scale integrations and technology and transformations. And he also helps guides the firm's thinking on value creation and capture uh, cultural and organizational compatibility and merger integration. Uh, capability building. So today he actually plays a huge role um, in his work as well. He serves um, at McKinsey in the role of actually uh, a senior partner and overlooks a global portfolio in the M&A world. So without further ado, let's bring on Oliver, our amazing speaker for today's session. So hello, how are you doing? Hey, Harsha, fine, thanks. Thank you for the introduction. That was way too positive in accolades. I hope I can live up to those expectations. <laughs> really? I felt like I didn't do it justice. Like I was reading up about all of the amazing work you do. And honestly, I 
it is so, I would say, fascinating to meet someone who works on such huge deal, deals that actually affect the lives of literally thousands, if not millions of people. So I'm honored for the opportunity to speak to you, to learn about your story of how you were able to do all of that and how you learned that along the way. And thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. So before we get into the like, super high level stuff, I wanted to, you know, turn back the clock a little bit, learn about your time when you were a student here at Penn. So I think you did your bachelor's degree here. You were, you, I think, triple majored while you were a student here. So tell us a little bit about how you were like when you were a student like this. Why did you pick Penn and the Wharton School in the first place? And what was your experience as a student like? Well, uh, let's see. I joined uh, and matriculated into Penn, specifically the Wharton School, uh, back in 86. Um, and for those of you that are worried, that was 1986, just to be clear. Um, and look, it was a little bit of serendipity. I was going to be a physician, and for some reason at age 17, I changed tracks at that point in time but didn't know what I wanted to be. And so my guidance counselor, his name was Mr. Rogers, kind of like the TV character with a pink cardigan sweater, said, oh, yeah, Mr. Rogers, okay, continue. He said, well, have you ever thought about business? And I said, uh, no, what, what do you mean business? He says, well, you know, you can, there's this like great business school called the Wharton School. Um, and I think you should look into that. So I looked into it. It was in Philadelphia. I had never been to Philadelphia before. And um, I sent in an application, early decision, never visited the school and was accepted. And, uh, and th that's how I kind of showed up at uh, Penn. And, you know, um, I knew I was going to a, a school that has had been... Um, uh, around for quite some time. It was the oldest uh, business school in the country, which was something that was very interesting to me. And um, I was nervous. It was big. It was, you know, a huge campus with lots of students and lots of research. And it was kind of famous. And I came from a small town. So this was, uh, this was a little different. Uh, but I tried to, you know, take up as much as I could. And I, since I was paying a lot of money for that school, I, yes, decided to triple major because I wanted every penny uh, uh, for my investment and hence, uh, hence the triple major. No, oh, that's amazing. And I completely understand what you're saying. I, I feel like this, the university itself is like a city. I, they actually call it University City. So, so, so not too far off. And, and I was completely blown away the first time I was there. And I, still get very lost and, and and very confused with with like just navigating that whole atmosphere and that whole environment so very very cool and i uh, totally agree with the point of like trying out as many things and, and you know getting the most out of that experience as well today you work in the mna space in a sense but i think and correct me if i'm wrong when you were at penn you you, you majored in and you're three so I, I like bringing this up i think it's really mind-blowing fact that you could do three majors but you did finance marketing and international management if i got that right correct so how did you kind of decide what you wanted to do leaving school and how did that kind of lead you to the world of MA? ah that is hilarious i had no idea what i wanted to do uh, after leaving school i was uh you know, I, I, I was, I, I, I learned to love business. Um, you know, it's not something I grew up with. The Wharton School certainly taught it to me. And I was trying to decide what to do afterwards. Um, and, you know, I guess one of the things was I really loved Philadelphia. It, it really grew on me and I enjoyed it. Um, and I wanted to stay there. So I was looking into training programs, young management training programs that were available uh, in the city because I felt I still had a lot to grow and a lot to learn um, and a lot to experience before I settled down too seriously in every any one given job. And there were a couple training programs that were of interest, but one in particular, and it was uh, offered by the oldest bank in the country, uh, Philadelphia National Bank. 
Um, and it was, uh, they had a holding company called Core States, and they had this fantastic uh, bank training program, which was um, about trust banking, commercial banking, wholesale banking, um, and transactions banking. And um, I decided to matriculate uh, or, or to apply there. Uh, they accepted me, and I matriculated into their uh, uh, training program um, and proceeded to stay another five amazing years in Philadelphia, where I learned all about, um, you know, banking, um, transactions, um, commercial banking, and trust banking. Okay, very, very interesting. I like how though you went from like the oldest university to the oldest bank, you know, like, like, sets a lot of like, like history behind your career and a lot of backing. One of the things that I've I'm very curious about, and I think in your time there, you became, I think, assistant vice president. So you you obviously grew from the management training program to doing amazing work there. But one of the things I'm very curious is how is it like adapting from, you know, prior to that being a student and coming in and, and learning the ropes and eventually in a relatively short amount of time, climbing up to such a high position? What do you think was something that you did differently from everyone else in, in, in probably that same management training position? that made you stand out from the rest? Well, first of all, Wharton uh, prepared me beautifully uh, for this uh, career. Um, uh, and therefore I could perform on the job extremely well. I think the second thing was, you know, recognizing that you had to collaboratively work with all sorts of people in all sorts of different roles of all sorts of tenures. Um, and the more collaborative you were and the better your work was, uh, the faster one would progress. So that's something that I figured out fairly easily because you don't do things by yourself. It is usually a collective. And those people that are really successful are successful because a lot of people help them. And the reason why people help them was because they like those people and they, they in turn are helped by that individual. So that was a little bit of the mantra that I helped carry uh, when I was first at the bank and it seems to have paid well. Very nicely said. And, and I think like, was this the first space that you actually got introduced to m &A in a way um, and, and kind of the first role where you, you got a bit of introduction to that? Or what was at that point in time, the, the project or the type of work that you found the most fascinating? Well, it was interesting. It was where I was introduced to, uh, you know, lending and trust banking and transaction banking. And then ultimately, the chairman had su suggested that I get involved in a number of internal transactions. Um, back then, Philadelphia National Bank was a triple A bank, which was the highest rated bank uh, from a risk and credit worthiness standpoint in the country. There were only two, two other banks that had that, uh, Morgan being the one of the other ones. And therefore, uh, the bank was using its very strong balance sheet, cash flow, and income statement to acquire other banks. Um, and as a result, uh, Maury Dorrance, who was the chairman at the time, had asked that instead of doing lending or doing transactions for clients, would I actually help the management team with their own transactions? And in that process, um, we acquired Hamilton National Bank, we acquired New Jersey National Bank, and we acquired First Pennsylvania Bank in Philadelphia. And I was uh, uh, part of those teams um, and that also helped integrate those banks uh, into core states and Philadelphia National Bank's operations. No, very, very cool. And I, and I wanted to bring that up just because, you know, I mean, like, like integrating all of these different organizations is not something easy at all every like every company that you probably bring in or every bank that you probably bring in has their own culture they have their own teams they have their own way of doing things is in your role as someone who is relatively new to the scene and, and having to to work on on such a huge task in a way how do you think or what was the most important thing you learned in those early stages that enabled you to to not only have a very successful career in MA from like post your career at that particular bank but how did what did you learn that enabled you to carry out your job even then effectively and bring everyone into the fold in a way that you know like 
excelled in it or, or meant good business for the company you were working with? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I think there were uh, three things became uh, pretty apparent to be really, really important as we were working on identifying potential targets to acquire, as well as when we were doing the due diligence, and then ultimately when a deal was reached, integrating them into our operations. And those three objectives were, number one, of course, all of the systems had to be integrated flawlessly. There could be no glitches. There could be no hiccups. The, you know, the accounts had to transfer over from one bank to the other. The ATM cards had to work from one card to the other. The trust accounts had to come over. Um, you know, if you had cash management services, that had, it, and it had to happen flawlessly. But that alone wasn't enough to have a successful transaction. <clears throat> As the acquirer, you've paid a, paid a premium uh, to acquire that target. And therefore, you know, you have to deliver certain synergies. You have to create a, a additional value. So it was really important to also figure out how were we going to deliver substantial value uh, to shareholders above and beyond the premium that was paid uh, for the target. Um, and therefore, there was always a very big premium paid or, or uh, attention paid to combinatorial synergies as well as transformational synergies. Um, in order to really open up the ap aperture on what could be done from a value creation standpoint. <clears throat> but then the third um, realization was both the first and the second objective are great and they look great on paper, but at the end of the day, people need to deliver on those. Um, and, and it's all about the people. And do the people, do you have the right people in the right place with the right capacity and the right capabilities? And are they set up for success in the new environment to do their jobs? Um, and so it's all about standing up the new organization, the integrated organization for success. And what, what I learned fairly, fairly early on is you need to do all three really, really well. And that's when you got, when magic happened. But that's hard. That's not easy to do in a sense, because again, three very distinct pieces and, and, and some that get overlooked more than others. E even beyond that experience, how do you balance the moving parts? Because some of those objectives may come in conflict with another. Like you bring in a new system and things like that. People in the original organization may not be fully ready to adapt. Or, or you know, on the other side, you, you can't always, you know, like like some members of the team may leave, others may not be happy. So how do you make sure that you are able to manage, you know, the overall balance of things while keeping those three objectives aligned? Well, I, you know, let, let's take your first example. Like, um, are, are they ready for the new system? Well, you, you have to help them get ready for the new system. And helping people get ready for the new way of working, for the new system, the new process, the new tomorrow, is you need to explain to them and celebrate what they've accomplished on their own in the past and treat them with a lot of respect. But then show them um, the new way of doing things, the new system, and try to explain why it's better. And then the third thing is then you need to train them up on that and give them the opportunity to learn how to work in that new system, that new process, or that new way of doing things. And then you need to think about how to incentivize people so that they do what you want them to do. And that those incentives can be positive incentives, or they can be punitive. Like if you don't do this, X, Y, Z happens. And then last but not least, we need to see people role model that new, that new way of working in that new system, in that new process and how it got adopted and how it made everybody's life easier and how better results were uh, delivered. And, you know, you want to package all of that with, a, you know, a, a, a value proposition story that wins the hearts and minds of people so that they actually want to move to the new way of working. And I think when you do that, change is a lot easier. Change gets adopted a lot. 
But notice it's a lot of investment, right? It's a lot of effort in order to deliver on that. Okay, very, very well said. Like, especially like that last part of you've got to package it in a way that, you know, moves people in a sense. Okay, very well said. You, despite having learned all of this hands-on in an early part of your career, went on to actually do, I think, your MBA. And you did this at a different business school, not Wharton, very sad, but you then chose to kind of take a, like, go back and learn and, and, and bring that back into the game. Why did you make that decision at that point in your career? And why did you choose Tux over us at that point in time? Um, so um, the bank was moving to elect me as a corporate vice president of the bank, which would have made me the youngest officer of the uh, bank in its 250 plus year history. And I had to pause for a moment and say, hey, I'm 27 years old. Um, if I do this next step, I'm here forever because that's, that's a real commitment. You, that is, you know, I'm done. Um, and um, what's going to happen to me when I'm 50, 55, 60? Banks get taken over all the time. Sometimes banks get in trouble because they did something stupid and, uh, you know, um, and they don't exist anymore. And do I really want to go through life without an MBA? And while I was already fairly senior and making uh, decent money, I said, if I don't jump ship right now and get an MBA, it'll be next to impossible, either because I'm way too deep into the, my career already, or it just becomes financially much more difficult. So I decided to tender my resignation, uh, much to the dismay of the president of the bank, um, and, um, you know, they were secretly hoping that I wouldn't go, and, but I did, but I did. And, um, um, and I decided to go to the Amos Tuck School of Finance and Commerce um, at uh, Dartmouth. Now, you might ask, why did you choose that school? Yeah. And often, most people would say, oh, that's a clearly obvious, right? Um, you went to the oldest undergraduate business school, and then you went to the oldest bank. Now you went to the oldest graduate business school in the country. <laughs> you yeah, me? you're following the trend. Yeah, I'm following <laughs> the trend. But uh, the fact is, that's not really why I uh, chose Tuck. I chose Tuck because for me, it was the antithesis of Wharton. Um, at the time, we were 157 students with 53 professors. Uh, there were no, there's no research, it's just a teaching uh, institution, so lots of casework and only casework. And uh, it was located in the country, tucked <clears throat> up in the woods in the middle of nowhere, which was a very different feel than University City, as you had mentioned. So it was a different no, experience. And I think it's a very enlightened perspective to have, you know, like at that point in your career to make the jump in the first place, it like itself requires a lot of reflection. And you can see the MA kind of thought process kind of weighed in a little bit there. But to, to intentionally kind of pick something that was different from what you had known or what you already had, it itself is, is really, really fascinating. So what do you think was something that you learned from this completely different world of, of learning? that helped you see things differently in the next part of your career? Well, it was very interesting. Um, the size of the school, 157 students with 53 professors had a profound impact. Specifically, they kind of knew everything about you. They knew exactly what you were doing and with whom and when. There were no secrets. <laughs> Okay. And as a result, uh, you know, I like to joke around and say, Wharton taught me how to be a business shark. And Tuck taught me how to dress that up as a gentleman. Um, because you just had to be super collaborative, super um, uh, consensus oriented, super, you know, it was the group, it was the team. It was all of your 157 colleagues that you knew by name and you knew their significant others by name. Um, it was a much more familial feel. At Wharton, we were like 800 folks, right? And if you 
got someone upset, you know, you just go off into another group. That wasn't av- that wasn't possible at, at Tuck. So I think that because of, because of its size and how familial it was, and so I think that's a it was something very different and very special uh, that I learned at Tuck um, that I uh, continue to really really enjoy that I had gone through. Amazing, amazing. Tell like tell us a little bit about some of the experiences you had while you were there. I think you had a very interesting internship kind of thing when you were there. Um, as well, I think it was something to do with like this publishing company, right? You, so that was something a little bit different from your previous experiences. Why choose that internship compared to you know things that you've done before? And again, why do you think the like how was that experience meaningful in its difference to your experience as a, in your career as a whole? Well, again, uh, people might think that I chose this internship. It was with. Hütics Verlagsgemeinschaft. I was going to try to pronounce the name. I was like, I'm getting that wrong. But I heard you speak German like, like pretty well. So thank you for pronouncing it. <laughs> yes, I speak German. And so this publisher uh, was uh, located in Heidelberg, Germany, which is a, a, a city down in the south, towards the south uh, western part of Germany in the state of Baden-Württemberg. And... Um, you know, a lot of people would connect the dots and say, oh, it's because it's one of the oldest publishers in all of Europe. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. I'm so sorry. I did not see that. But OK. All right. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Just so it, uh, it originally was founded in 1730. Um, it was the first medical publisher in the world. They uh, produced the first medical transcripts and uh, journals and books and textbooks. They were affiliated with the University of Heidelberg, which was one of the original medical universities in the world. Um, And then later on, they became, um, they were uh, the publicists for some of the world's best and greatest mathematicians and physicians. So they're the original publishers of Max Planck, and Albert Einstein. They had all the original manuals of Albert Einstein. And um, I was asked to um, uh, to help them um, because this was the beginning of digitization. Nothing like we have today, right? But this was, you know, this is 1991. You know, everything is still paper, but you can see the emergence of digital coming. Uh, and um, they... Uh, were struggling with that emergence of new technology and wanted a roadmap on how to deal with that. And so, you know, I, I went over to Germany uh, on that internship to help them with that and help them analyze their finances and figure out how they could, how much they could invest behind that and uh, help them with their banks in order to make some of that work from a lending perspective. So it was all uh, pretty exciting stuff. It is very exciting. Was there anything different about the culture of, of you know, like stepping out to somewhere in Europe versus like like the work that you've done previously here in the U.S.? Oh, their quality of life is far better than ours in the U.S. <laughs> they drank beer at lunch. They took off on Fridays at three o'clock. <laughs> The great quality of life. <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting, but I'm glad you said that. Okay, I will we'll make sure that, like, I think everyone's here and I'm not going to start booking their next internships in Germany. So, okay, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the tip. But interestingly enough, like, how did all, like, like one of the things that, that can be hard to do is when you learn something and then you, you try to bring it into an existing organization with the next step. So tell us a little bit about how, you know, you got into McKinsey and how did you bring all of these different experiences and the things that you had learned from, you know, internships in Germany, MBA at, at, at a place where, you know, highly collaborated space and the, the the previous experience of, you know, all of the work you've done. How did you bring all of that into an organization like McKinsey in your new role after that? I think you became a senior partner afterwards. So tell us a little bit about how, as an individual, the the, the kind of, merging of all of these experiences helped you in the next step of your career? Well, look, um, uh, McKinsey contacted me um, in my second year of school um, 
and uh, I had never worked for McKinsey before. I certainly knew who they were. Uh, they were pretty famous. And it's in the Wharton Student Bible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was, by the way, the second oldest consulting com uh, company. So you were deviating a little bit from the habit pattern. You're no, like because I am now at the oldest continuously running uh, consultancy in the world because A.D. Little went bankrupt. So I'm, ba I'm back on track. <laughs> You're back on track. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So number one again. Got it. <laughs> so um, the, you know, they have a very formal program. They hire folks who are insecure overachievers, who you know always think they were the hiring mistake. By the way, to this day, I think I'm the hiring mistake. Um, and, and at some point, they're going to figure out and they're going to retract my offer from 29 years ago. Um, and and what they do is they leverage your intrinsics, they leverage your previous experiences, but they shape it and mold it in their approach, the way they do problem solving, the way they do client leadership, the way they do team leadership. And um, while you draw on your past, you draw on it through another lens, a new lens, um, the McKinsey way. And um, it's something that I very, very much enjoyed, so much so that I stayed here for 29 years. I actually thought I was only going to be at the firm for a year or two and then move on. And that year or two just kept extending. Okay, now you've got to tell me the story of you getting into like, 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 like the the whole part of why you thought you were the mistake. But, but okay, and, and why everyone thought that they were individually their own, like, like, like in the same boat in a sense. So you now you've got to tell me that story. So, so what was it like? You know, you got the offer, you got in. What was maybe your first couple of months on the team like, or in the organization like? Well, the first two weeks was is training. You're not in on a team. They actually, you know, put you through a training program so that you can operate uh, uh, like a team. And then um, I remember being sent to my first study, what they were, since I was pretty good in finance, right? One of my majors did a lot of finance work and yeah. M&A. Oh. And um, there was a, uh, they needed an associate um uh, who was very good at financial modeling and being able to model strategic options. And so uh, I was asked to go to Hartford, Connecticut, um, uh, and join a team that was already on the ground. Um, and my role was to do all things finance uh, for this team. And that's one thing that the firm does really well. They figure out what you're really good at, um, and then they leverage that and put you in a situation where you can benefit from what you're really good at. But in the meantime, you learn everything else ar around you, you know, and um, you begin opening your own repertoire a little further because of the exposure that you have by working uh, with your teammates on this more comprehensive problem. And so, you know, early on, my role was finance and the modeling and um, showing people how, how the different strategic options were valued and what the impact on the income statement and the valuation of the firm would be as they pursued them. So that made me very comfortable because I certainly knew how to do that. Um, uh, and in the process, learned a lot about that industry and that client and how to do problem solving and how to work in a big team and how to lead clients. How do you, and you mentioned, you know, you start off with the thing that you're very good at and you learn kind of the, the lay of the land through working with that big team. How did you see your career evolving? Or how was your career shaped in a sense to today with the global role and everything? Um, look, I think you're always shaped by your experiences. And I think you're also shaped by the people around you. Um, and let's be honest. The things that shape you the most are the things that haven't gone so well. The things where maybe it was disastrous because you made some sort of an assumption or did something assuming that that would work and it really, really didn't. And boy, you remember those lessons and you uh, quickly remember not to repeat those. Um, but there's also, you know, mo it's mostly positive experiences. Um, 
but I think you're shaped by your experiences, by the, your own lessons learned, and by the people around you. And I think one thing that folks don't realize is the people part of the equation is probably the most important. Because, you know, you could be on the sexiest problem in the sexiest industry with the sexiest client having a really sexy role. But if you're surrounded by jerks and you're not having a good time, you're, you're going to be miserable. And eventually you're going to, it's going to backfire and fail. But by surrounding yourself with people that you do like, surrounding by people that really invest in your own development, in your development, and help you grow, because you can't do everything yourself. You're going to have to really um, benefit from the altruism of others. Um, uh, that is the key. That is, that's a huge unlock. No, that's a very, very good, like, like and, and I believe that wholeheartedly as well. It's like, it, it, and I always say, like, I am probably the the, the most dull knife in, in the drawer. And, and, and it's just because I have such amazing people around me that I'm able to do anything at all. And, and even from waking up in the morning to to just going by my day. And, and But one question that I have in that sense is when you when you're assigned a team or, or sometimes even when you are, when you when you get to pick in a sense and you're in a team, you come in with the experience of, of the area that you are good at and other people do the same they have the areas that they that they're great at and you see things from a different perspective from one another how do you go about navigating those different like perspectives even in times where you know someone maybe comes across in a way you don't you that you don't like or, or someone's having a completely different way of approaching and solving the problem than you do have you ever been in those situations where you know you don't always necessarily get on 100% with the person you're working with, even though they are so valuable to the team and they bring such a good perspective? And how do you actually go about making sure that you can work together to achieve that final end result for the client, for the person, you know, for, for the problem you're trying to solve? Of course that happens. And that happens more often than anybody would like to admit. But that's what makes life so beautiful, right? It's that constructive conflict. The key is, how do you unlock the constructive conflict and turn it into something good? Instead yeah, I'm very bad at that. Sorry, continue. Instead of turning it into a downward spiral. And I think there are a number of techniques and a number of approaches that we very formally work with our teams and train our teams on how to do. For example, we one of the tools we use is Myers-Briggs. Many people know this, but you know, for those that don't, um, you know, it's four measures and it measures people's own personal preferences. Are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Meaning, where do you get your energy from? Do you, do you need alone time to review a document or do you like thro throwing ideas up at the board, right? Uh, second of all is how do you solve problems? Are you intuitive or are you very detail oriented? So, are you the person that needs to see the whole model and all the details, and then you bubble up an answer? Or do you see two points, draw a line, and say, okay, let's get the detail to make sure that my conclusion is correct? And then as you make your decisions, are you more thinking or more feeling? It, it, are you more like if A equals B, then B equals C, then therefore A must equal C? Or... Are you more like, that may be true, but that may not be the best answer because it won't fly well with people. People won't adopt it. Um, and you're you're worried about the adoption rate or how, how it will be perceived by people. So that's t thinking versus the feeling part. And then last but not least is the whole judgmental versus perception. So you know, do you have lists for your lists? And if it's not on the list, you don't do it. And if you did it and it wasn't on the list, you put it on the list so you get to cross it off. Or are you the person that says, yeah, I'm not going to make a decision. I'm going to wait to the last second because I want to weigh all my options all the way to the last second, right? Um, and, and you just have open agendas and you just kind of like go with the flow. People are very different on each of those dimensions. Yeah. And you need to understand, oh, Harsha is, you know, having her open agenda, and Oliver is being very close. Okay, well, the good thing is Oliver wants to get things done, but sometimes he closes down a conversation a little too early. 
Harsha might leave the options open way too long and then we won't never get it done by. So you need to bring both both individuals together and say, hey, I understand what you're trying to do. You understand what I'm trying to do. So where, where's the right middle? Where's the right middle point for that? And that's true on all those four of those dimensions. And what we see is that eliminates, not doesn't eliminate, it diffuses the conflict and you can appreciate and understand your colleague where they're coming from and have a constructive conversation. Very, very well then. I like how you articulated those four. I could see like, like in my mind, I was like, okay, I know someone does that. I like, like I do this, all right. So, so very well articulated. As we kind of wind down our conversation, one of the things I wanted to just, you know, talk about was also in, in this whole aspect of, you know, managing people, working with people in a sense, what do you think is the biggest problem that people don't often foresee or, or, or that people like are blinded to when they interact and work and collaborate with others? towards their goal and then maybe share some of your examples or stories of, of things that didn't go as well as planned and, and how you got that back on track. Well, I think one of the things that surprises people the most is we may be using the same words, but they have very different meanings. And therefore, we're talking past each other. And sometimes you really have to unpack what the words mean. So as an example, I'm going to use an, a merger case. Two companies were coming together, and uh, it was said the decision makers need to be in the room. And the one company came with the president, the CFO, and the CHRO. And the other company came with 20 people. And there was like, What? And the company that came with the president, the CFO, and the CHRO said, we said decision makers. And the other side said, these are the decision makers. That's not possible. You have a president and you have the head of finance. That's all you ought to need. And you have the head of HR. That's all you ought to need. And the other side would say, no, actually, that's not what we need because the way we operate, we, you know, we're all, we, we do decisions in a collaborative manner. And it affects different, you know, different parts of the organization. And our decision-making matrix is much broader and much bigger. <clears throat> and so this was a point of conflict or contrast between these two companies. And this notion of what words mean and what do they really mean can be very different but, uh, between two companies or between two people. Um, and therefore, we shouldn't always assume that everybody uses the words that we've used the same way as they would use it or understand it. And we should spend the time a little bit more really unpacking that and gaining better appreciation uh, for the nuances. Okay, that's a, that's a very good example though. I mean, and oh my goodness, I, I, I can definitely see, see both sides on that point of view. And okay, I, I, I like how you use that example. As we kind of come to the end of our 45 minutes for today, I just wanted to ask in a sense, what has been your biggest lesson that you've learned over the last few years in the role that you have? I mean, you today advise top C-suite executives, you, you've worked on hundreds of projects. From all of this, what is something that you learned that you think you know enables you to do your job to the best possible caliber? If you took one, or like only one. God gave you two ears and two eyes and only one mouth. <laughs> use use those faculties in that ratio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> why that? I'm, I'm so curious. Why that specifically? I think... Often people like to assert and to tell when we actually should be listening, learning, and appreciating before we assert. Okay. And I, good ratio. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Any final words of wisdom for students right now who probably were where you were at, you know, when you were at Penn, who aren't here? <laughs> 
where they're headed next or, or what they want to do, but they know they love business. They know they want to be in some shape or form in this industry. Where where do they start exploring? What do they do? Yeah. Don't stress out. It all works out in the end. Um, follow your instincts and great things will happen. <coughs> all right. Excuse me. Well, yeah, but I'll like I'll just let you have your water. And meanwhile, I just wrap this up and say thank you so much for joining us and, and thank you so much for being part of the show and, and taking your time to share with us a lot of really, really good advice that I think we don't normally hear about from the finance and business textbooks that we that we're trained to read. No, I'm serious, I'm serious. Like the people part I think we spoke about a lot is almost very and I wouldn't say ignored, but it's much better now. But like, it's not the main highlight of things at times. And I'm really glad we got to highlight it through this conversation. And I'm really glad for your experiences. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you've had at least a fraction of the amount of fun that I've had listening to your answers and that I think the audience has had, you know, listening in as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Harsha. You're a wonderful host and good luck to uh, with everything. And if there are ever any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, happy holidays yeah happy holidays have a lovely holiday season and to our audience thank you so much for joining us we appreciate you tuning in as well and until next thursday meanwhile enjoy this end of semester and have a great rest of the year bye you're listening to changing reality changing reality where we bend reality all across the world only on WQHS Radio.